Welcome to the Know It Some podcast, bringing you the widest variety of conversational interviews for a well-rounded perspective on life. Because while it's true, nobody likes a know-it-all, it's also good to know it some. Here's your host, Steve Platt. That's right. Welcome back to the Know It Some podcast. I'm your host, Steve Platt. And this week, we're sitting down with historian and documentarian, Michael Finney to discuss the Columbian Exposition. This is the 400-year anniversary of the Columbus Voyages to the New World. It took place back in 1893. It was the World's Fair in Chicago. It was an incredible event with tons of firsts, and, and there was electricity, and there was Ferris wheels, and it was amazing. And we get to talk about it on this podcast. A lot of interesting tidbits. If you're a history nerd like myself, a history buff like myself, you're going to really love this episode because uh, Michael is just a wealth of knowledge. It was an honor to have him on the program, and he's done a number of incredible projects, including a National Parks project. So if you like the Jacob Frank episode, you're going to love this episode as well. Folks, without further ado, please welcome my friend Michael Finney. Hey, Michael, welcome to the Know It Some podcast. Thanks for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. Hey, it's, it's an honor to have you on. I uh, fell in love with the 1893 project when it was shown to me. And as soon as I saw it, uh, I knew that you had to be a guest on the podcast to come on and talk about it. And I know you've done a number of things with uh, the national parks. Uh, you're, you're just kind of a, an anomaly because... Uh, there aren't a lot of people who put in the work that you've put into to gather all of these things together and, and into a, all these different media formats, whether it be, you know, audio visual, whether it be a book. Um, it, it's, it's really incredible to, to me what you've done. Uh, I guess where I'd like to start is, is just take a step back and, and ask you, you know, you've always been kind of a historian documentarian. Has that always been something that interested you? Uh, and if not, like what, what got you interested in, in delving into the past? Well, uh, you know, I appreciate you having me on, uh, as I said before, and I would say that I think of myself, you know, maybe as a citizen scientist and part of, um, you know, exploring the, whatever field of science you are, you're looking at, whether that is kind of like digging through the minutia of history, um, or, you know, forging history as we, we move into the future. Uh, those are all things that I think regular people can do. Anyone can start from wherever you are. You can begin to document things. You can begin to observe things and record information. And it really, you, you don't have to be an academic authority. You can become a lay person who, who knows uh, a good amount of stuff. And it's always very impressive that we find uh, oftentimes, you know, regular people are are discovering things or uncovering things that you know just pops up out of nowhere they find something in their attic or you know they're out at um you know like a swap meet or something like thing, things get uncovered and, and history reveals itself you know yeah. as, as we begin to, to delve into that and i would say for me where i started with um you know documentary and things like that so there are probably two major influences for me. I used to love watching uh, Marty Stauffer's Wild America uh, mm. with, my, with my dad as a kid. Yeah. So I, I just remember that footage, you know, seeing seeing that footage and his narration was always so great. Uh, I loved the, the, the tonality of his voice and yeah. the just the the general vibe of his voice and also the footage, which is, you know, it's great. Um, then the second one, you know, which is everybody's really, I think it's probably like Ken Burns, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, everybody, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, what, what am I like a millennial or something or a <laughs> millennial Oregon trail micro generation person, you know, right. we grew up with a lot of his work being on television and like watching baseball and watching jazz and watching, uh, the civil war and all the other ones that he's released over the years as he keeps going and, and producing this stuff and his techniques and style uh, have evolved, but also really kind of like solidified the form that has emerged, um, you know, over the last, say, 30 plus years, as we have seen documentaries become this very 
Um, I don't, I don't want to say it's a cottage industry. I think the documentary at this point is huge. You know, when you see something like Fahrenheit nine 11, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, came out in, in the two thousands. Now I watched that movie in the theater on Manhattan Island when it first came out. And when that screen goes black as the towers are hit, I listen to New Yorkers bust into tears and it's a profound bitter experience. And it, you know, it touches me to this day. It moved me then though producing those kind of moments at some point, you know, I would love to be able to, to generate that quality of work and those kind of uh, emotional um, nexus points where people just, you know, you bring the past to life and people are able to, uh, travel in their mind to whenever or wherever and that you know that's just that's very human to me yeah and it's powerful you know i i think i feel the same way you do in terms of how documentaries have have got it big now in fact it's a huge portion of what you can find uh in video on demand apps like netflix and and others uh, because so many people are interested in them now more than ever but then it, to your point about a lay person being able to, to kind of pick it up and, and run with it and delve into the past and uncover things, we all have that ability, but not everybody has maybe that, that passion, that focus and that effort towards uh, bringing all that together. You get mm. what I'm saying? Like, For sure. So let me drill down a little bit more into, say, like the Chicago project itself, right? Yeah. So I you know, grew up around Chicagoland as we call it, um, mm-hmm. from there. Cubbies and, fan or White Sox fan? Uh, White Sox fan, come on. There we go. I like baseball. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, growing up around the city, uh, the 1893 fair has like this legacy, you know, the, it's like an undercurrent that you find in different places. And because it was so long ago, even, you know, in my childhood, like you hear about this thing, but you don't really ever like, connect with it a lot of the even the museums like when i was growing up they didn't have you know tons of this stuff on display all the time and also like when you're a kid like you go see sue i want to see this dinosaur i want to see egypt i want to do this other Mm -hmm. stuff and even though they have these major collections at the field and all that um you know it it requires more attention and it, it requires um you know a little bit more um patience to really start to whittle down uh, what all was going on there and how not only affected the city, but, um, you know, culture kind of moving forward into the 20th century, which is kind of my thesis uh, within that project and, and how, how dynamic the results of that period of time are not only to Chicago, but the U S and, you know, by and large the world. So, right. You cross paths with these buildings. Uh, for me, the real like, um, you know, catalyst for starting to deep dive into the project was getting uh, an antique book, you know, that was produced from Charles Arnold's photos of the fair. So I have right. a very large book. It's about tabloid sized pieces of paper uh, and the photos in there is just hundreds of photos. So in 2018, and I'd been sending a few of these pictures to a few friends just to show them, you know, that are from like around Chicago and maybe they'd seen some of the stuff, maybe they hadn't. But I will say that like, because my book is from 1893, 1894, like the photo quality is very, very good. I would say that the photos that I was sharing with them in some ways were superior to what you will find online. So then I was, I was traveling out West actually at the time. And then I just so looked and I was like, oh, it's like the 125th anniversary of this event this year. It just like clicked in my head. Um, This is 2018. And it was the summer. And I was looking and saying like, well, how much of the year is left? And there were, you know, maybe 150 days at that point left in the year. I was like, what if I did like one post a day for the last 125 days of the 125th anniversary of this event. So that's how it started was this Twitter thread. Well, I mean, anybody can do that, you know, just click for me, you know, there might be some other thing that you can uh, correlate for a project of your own. But like, for me, it was like, yeah, let let, let me see if I can actually manage to do this. So every day, uh, you know, I would take a photo, I would write a little blurb and that thread is still available on my Twitter. So it's in my uh, moments. So if you go there, you can find those two um, moments that I, kind of collected everything up into 
Nice. And you can go back and, and look at those photos. Now, as I was getting through that, I was like, I've kind of done a bit of work here. I had like 80 photos at the time and had put in a bunch of blurbs. And I was like, well, I wonder how much I've written, you know? Uh, so I started to gather all that up and was looking at the word count. And I was like, I've kind of written a decent amount here. Uh, and had It wasn't like novel length, but it was, you know, hand, like a few thousand words or whatever. So then I started taking it more seriously, the blurbs that I was writing and fleshing out the ideas and the um, just how much editorial I was putting with the picture inside of the thread. So then by the end of that, I was like, okay, maybe I can put this together as like a blog post or whatever. And I did share that out with all the pictures and stuff on medium, but then it started to occur to me that like, I could do something more uh, produced, right? A book. So that uh, process started in uh, like January of 2019. I started to kind of work through that. I had never put out a book. So I was like, well, you know, I see a lot of people publishing books and they don't necessarily have uh, a publishing deal, but they're doing it on Amazon. I'm like, I, probably can do this. I think I have all the technology to, to manage doing that. Right. And like I've worked in media for many years. So I used to work with a few print publications and had, you know, dabbled with those things. So it wasn't a totally foreign idea to me. Mm -hmm. um, so as I was doing that and kind of massaging the editorial into chapters and a narrative, you know, I started to bookend the the narrative with the idea that like, the Colombian Exposition is the doorstep of the 20th century. All of the commercial and industrial uh, offerings that happen there, these are very revolutionary. It creates 20th century uh, culture, right? And it, this right. is what explodes out into the world, um, you know, processed food and, um, you know, convenience. Convenience technology is really uh, highly introduced at, at this event. So... Yeah, I, so about that, about how it's kind of like the doorstep there for the 20th century. I, I feel like the magnitude of the impact of the Columbian Exposition and World Fairs in general, mm. it, it, we can't find something like that at times. Yes, there are expositions and conferences and, and fairs and whatnot, but yeah, for people to really understand what a World Fair really brought at the you know back then then uh, yeah speaking about world fairs that ended i mean i want to say the last one that i think can be even put into the same category is maybe the 1964 uh new york world's fair and and i don't mm. even know that it's fair to to put that into the same category sure um but but really i i think these go back to the 1700s maybe late 1700s all over the world and when it came to the u.s it was a pretty big deal i mean if i'm not mm. mistaken and, and correct me if i'm wrong like the House of Representatives voted on where to have this, right? Numerous times. And it was a big conflict uh, because New York was pushing for it and Chicago was pushing for it and Chicago had had, had the fire and it was kind of like re-emerging. Uh, so that fire, yes, it burnt down the city, but burning down the city allowed this other thing to happen, yeah. which was that they had to rebuild the city. And many architects cut their teeth and made their name in Chicago in that little interim period between the fire and the Columbian exposition. And mm -hmm. so it all of a sudden, you know, we say that skyscrapers were invented in Chicago and, you know, it's because they had a clean slate as a result of that fire that they were able to experiment and try things and implement stuff. Yeah. So that, um, you know, was huge. And that's how you end up getting Burnham and Root. Uh, and Daniel Burnham becomes the director of works for the event. And, you know, he is a legend in Chicago in terms of architecture and, you know, uh, the Chicago plan and so many other things around the city as well. Yeah, I think the World's Fair's offices for this Columbian Exposition were on like the top two floors of uh, one of the first uh, skyscrapers, uh, the, the McNally building, the Rand McNally mm -hmm. uh, building that's no longer there. Um, but I, I did read that about Chicago and about the architecture. I'm fascinated by the fact that this all took place in, in an area that, you know, <laughs> as opposed to New York, did not have maybe the backing of uh, the folks that were plugging for it in New York. Because, you know, right. I, I, I believe uh, Astor and uh, a few other, you know, Carnegie like uh, billionaires were, were offering money up uh, for it to go to New York. And, right. Chicago ended up with with the winning bid. It's it's kind of a cool thing that happened there in 
in your neck of the woods, in your city. Uh, let's talk about the cultural impact because you, you mentioned a lot of the things that it brought forth. And I'm, I'm familiar with some of it because uh, some of it's just a part of the zeitgeist and, 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 uh, and pop culture and whatnot. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of one that most people know, uh, Pabst Blue Ribbon and how it got its name. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but talk to me about some of the other stuff that came out of the World's Fair in 1893. Yeah, so I would say that like one of the biggest influences out of the event was food, right? Uh, the the food that was introduced there, uh, global. You know what I mean? Because there were there were vendors from around the world serving the people that were coming in every single day, mm-hmm. and the number of people that were there on any given day was huge. I mean, uh, you're looking at an event that had almost, I uh, I think estimates are they range but like let's say 25 million people or whatever right um came through the event and you know to say that 25 million people came through an event um you know that lasted like six months is to say that like hundreds of thousands of people are there like every single day you have to feed them (laughs) yeah so uh you know you see paps blue ribbon and like whether or not they want a blue ribbon at the at the event is (laughs) is kind of disputed but that's okay it's it's a great uh legend um and I think they still have their kind of like pavilion set up or a piece of it that was there, like at their um, home offices or headquarters or something like that. Um, I need to look a little bit more that into I did it. Not know. Yeah, I think I've crossed paths with that, that there's maybe maybe not the original, but maybe a replica. Um, cool. You know, there's so many details about everything that it's like it's impossible for any one person to know everything about this thing. But you right. also have another Chicago staple to this day, Vienna Beef. Um, those, those hot dogs were just in, in, incredible at the event. They, they go on to, uh, you know, be a Chicago, uh, staple. Mm-hmm. You've got shredded wheat. Uh, you got juicy fruit by Wrigley's again, another Chicago, uh, staple, not just Wrigley's gum, but like, you know, the Wrigley family in, in, in the area is, is still huge. We have Wrigley field to go back yep. to the Cubs. Yep. Um, and then you've got like Aunt Jemima, uh, you know, kind of introduces their product there. And over the last couple of years, we've seen that they've kind of like hit a wall on that and had to change their name. Um, but at the same time, like these things were introduced, people tried them and then they wanted them at home, you know, so that alters not only, you know, people's taste, but their their dinner tables. And also because this is processed food, you know, processed food kind of comes up during the Civil War to be able to feed the troops. But over the following decades, it really heats up. And then the Columbian Exposition, you know, introduces masses to it where they're like, yeah, we want this at home. We want to be eating these things. We like them. Uh, And they also save us time because Mm -hmm. they had to do less work to be able to, to, to feed themselves. So that kind of benefit really like opens up, you know, the, I, it, it expands on the idea of comfort and leisure time and all kinds of, uh, you know, hobbies that we see emerge, you know, sports really take off uh, in, in this period of time as well. Uh, many leagues that are still in operation to this day, uh, look back to the, the Gilded Age, the late 19th century. And um you know, I think that's really important. Additionally, uh, you have the Krupp exhibit, which, you know, if you're familiar with that period of time, was a weapons manufacturing company based in Germany. So they were they brought a, a bunch of weapons over to, to demonstrate. And so you have this industrial component as well. So there are many, many industrial um, uh, booths. I, that's not the right word, but um, displays where people are looking and saying like, Oh, wow, this would be great to be able to utilize this technology um, on our farm or inside of our business, or I could build a business around that technology as well. So then all of this stuff starts to really like build up. And uh, I think that that it, it doesn't define the 19th century, right? Mm-hmm. It preempts the 20th century. That that's how I view it. You know, that's that's my perspective on it. And, and, and people can disagree. That's okay. You know, like I said, I'm not a, 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 a proper academic of history. You know, I I do the best I can, and I know that like things get disputed and things get resolved over time. Um, I did make like a, a small kind of discovery um, inside of 
the research that I was doing, just finding out like who was the, um, one of the guys that was kind of like responsible for uh, like color and painting and stuff like that. We associate it with one particular name, uh, but actually like in Burnham's final report, we see that it was this other person who also gets mentioned in the book that I have, The Dream City, um, which is that collection of Charles Arnold photographs. And, you know, it, it typically always gets associated with this other person. And it kind of turns out that in the midst of creating this event, the responsibility shifted to someone else, you know, and that's, that's such a minor thing, but there's still history to discover. You know, there are still things that we can find. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's real interesting because it does kind of get lost to the pages of history because as time goes on, those things, uh, I think, get forgotten. Talk, talk to me a little bit about the, the Ferris wheel. Um, okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to know a little bit more about that. So the Ferris wheel was um, a massive, iconic uh, emblem and structure of the event. It was the first time that the Ferris wheel had debuted anywhere no one had uh ever ridden a ferris wheel before the columbia named Exposition. after the inventor mr wheel right I mean, no, well <laughs> mr ferris <laughs> yeah. uh who you know passed away not not too long after the event uh his his original ferris wheel was set up again at the st louis fair uh, i believe that was 1905 or maybe a few years earlier mm -hmm. um but yeah so the ferris wheel was meant as this massive attraction for the chicago fair uh, because initially, you know, they wanted something that would compete with the 1889 fair in Paris where they debuted Eiffel's tower. Okay. Uh, there was also talk at some point they had reached out to Eiffel and said, we would like you to build a tower here as well on the South side of Chicago mm. as like this premier, uh, emblem of the event. Uh, that didn't pan out, but they got the Ferris wheel and there's still a Ferris wheel in downtown Chicago to this day on Navy pier. Um, some, some photos of that and, and some video of that made its way into the documentary. So while it's not the Ferris wheel from the event, you know, the idea of this symbol permeating across time inside of the boundaries of, you know, what we call Chicago, you know, it's still there to this day. That's pretty so, cool. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And like people getting that far up into the air and being able to have bird's eye views, you know, was extremely rare. Okay. Uh, skyscrapers, this is a new idea. Not a lot of them existed. And certainly many that were getting called skyscrapers at that time were probably not reaching as high as the Ferris wheel. So only a few people had been up that high. So we had like uh, rigid airships and dirigibles and things like that being developed right. in the second half of the 18th century, or I'm sorry, the 19th century, the 1800s. Uh, right. And so these things were being, um, you know, developed for war and for, you know, just the technological exploration. But this was a very, very small collection of people uh, experimenting with this stuff. The Ferris wheel brings many, 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 many people up, up to these heights to be able to see the world uh, from this bird's eye view and really like make sense out of geography in a way that you can't from the ground, you know? Yeah. But you can map things still, out. Yeah. I mean, you would think that we still have flat earthers uh, out there <laughs> uh, to this day. It's funny, you know, 2021 and yet variations of the Ferris wheel still exist all mm -hmm. over the, the planet. And it's pretty darn cool to see that that idea has, has carried forward so prominently. Uh, and, and, and like you said, still in Chicago, even though it's not the same wheel, not the same location, uh, still a Ferris wheel associated with the city um, all these years later. Right. Uh, really, really cool. Let, so if you are back in 1893, you found the time machine that I hid and mm. uh, and you're visiting this fair, you're rubbing elbows and, and you know, maybe not literally, but you're you're among uh, some very notable people in in those throngs of, of hundreds of thousands of people. I know Houdini was there. I know Milton Hershey was there. In fact, he got some ideas there that uh, carry forward to this day. P pretty interesting folks. Also a pretty uh, nefarious uh, character um, visited the fair from what I understand. H. H. Holmes. Yeah. Are, are you familiar with his story? Yeah. The um, I can't remember his real name. H. H. Holmes is what he changed his name to. Uh, yeah. So obviously, you know, his story has been um, very 
popular in the wake of uh, Eric Larson's book, The Devil in the White City. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anybody that's not familiar with that, definitely check it out. It is a fantastic and fun book to read where he basically spins two narratives across the book. One is about Daniel Burnham and developing the fair. The other is about H.H. Holmes and his travels across the country, resulting in landing in Chicago and his building of his mansion. A lot of people refer to it as a murder mansion. How much murder occurred there? Uh, I'm not certain. I think that like, um, I think that enough history. <laughs> well, I think that history is sort of bending um, the facts a little bit to make it seem very more sensational. Um, yeah, more sensational. Um, I, I, mean, I believe he probably he killed a couple people murder. there. Yeah, but I I don't think that like there were dozens of people disappearing or that it was the result of his work. I think that he was. Um, so this is the way I've I've kind of kind of landed on my perspective on him is I think that like he is maybe not the first serial killer in the United States, but certainly like the herald of sociopathy in the United States that kind of emerges in the 20th century too, that we see. um, And that really kind of, you know, does solidify the concept of a serial murderer um, and just these like very graphic and horrific things. I'm not really into like, uh, any like true crime stuff or mm. like horror movies too much. That's not really my speed, but yeah. of course you cross paths with all this stuff. Uh, there's also a game that came out um, maybe a year or two ago based on the, the murder mansion and all that. And it looks You're super kidding. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Those, and they did a very limited run. I think it's sold out and it's not going to be reproduced. So it was like extremely, um, uh, what would we say? It was a, a boutique <laughs> production. Um, yeah. Yeah, those and I that mean, guy's really cool too. Actually, to, to your point about true crime and and horror movies, I think that there is a huge following for that. Um, it might not be what you or I are are really into, but I think there's a a lot of people that are, especially in the podcast casto sphere, folks are really into that kind of stuff. That I yeah. don't know why the 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 very macabre uh, kind of story interests the average listener so much, but they they are. So I think anybody listening to this should definitely check out what occurred there what allegedly occurred there Mm. uh, some of the the um exaggerated uh legend of of uh hh holmes and the the murder house the murder mansion whatever you want to call it you know how much of it's true and how and and to what degree uh he was a a mass murderer uh is is up for debate but uh definitely murdered multiple folks um and not necessarily uh uh, somebody you'd want to come across. Um, right. Talk about- well, he was, he was a, he was a total uh, like shady person. You know, he was just hustling yeah. people all over the country. Uh, actually. And he was in Canada too. So like he was internationally doing this stuff and it's just like uh terrible. He, I believe, you know, killed a business partner and then like that business partner's kids, maybe something like that. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, and, and like when he was on trial, he started to like, uh, admit to killing all these other people. And was, you know, I think that he was just kind of like clearly He's... suffered from some kind of like pathos and like that, I think maybe the reason why people are interested in those things today is because like we as humans, you know, recognize that there are these darker parts to our personalities or what we are as a species and that like this, this pathos is underlying and like, we have to, yeah. we have to like retain our humanity to keep those things at bay. It's important. It's certainly important. And yeah, like you, you mentioned, he, he confessed to killing so many people that were demonstrably still alive. Right. Um, so we knew that he was lying. Right. And yet a very fascinating, fascinating story. Uh, among the, the less nefarious folks that, that visited the fair, uh, whether it be Milton Hershey or or Houdini, both of which I, I mentioned earlier, if you're if you're there at the fair, um, and you're walking among these pavilions and these uh, demonstrations and different things, I, I mean, what what is it like? Like, take take us back there if you can. What would you experience if you decided to to maybe drive over to Chicago? Um, well, for- you wouldn't have been driving at that point in time because there were there were no automobiles yet. Well, there were horses. Um, well, right. Yeah. You would drive a, a team of horses, um, trains, <laughs> you know, there was a huge, um, station for, for train arrival. I mm-hmm. think for me, the biggest, most interesting, uh, names that crossed 
that again uh, cross paths at the Columbian Exposition has to be um, what has been in a few movies. Uh, the current war, uh, I think, dives into the uh, competition between uh, Edison and Tesla and Westinghouse and the contract to light up the event, right? So even though Edison loses the contract to light the event, he is still present at the event and actually, uh, you know, demonstrating direct current electricity and his lighting and other inventions and things like that too. But, you know, it is really uh, Tesla and Westing Westinghouse who light the event. And this was, again, even though lights had existed for a number of years, this was the event where many, many people experienced electric light. And not only like, oh, yes, that's an electric light, but massive uh, displays of electric light just all over the Grand Basin, looking um, you know, at, at the administration building being lit up, uh, spotlights and things like that, just to be able to, uh, you know, light up the pathways and then, and then the canals as well. So that, uh, you know, to me, I think is just real magic pulled out of the ether and like put into place in 1893. There's just something about, um, that to me that really like, again, it's the doorstep of the 20th century. We take these things for granted. Now, if you go into a room, you expect to flip the light and have light then yep. less so right so yeah wealthy people were lighting up their homes uh there were a few experimental towns where they had contracted with edison and or westinghouse at that time you know which is why uh there's that movie with uh, uh benedict cumberbatch um you know where they're basically he's doing all of this really heinous stuff to speak about the danger of alternating current tesla's system for mm -hmm. delivering electricity and, and using the media to, um, you know, sling mud at him. Uh, yeah. Fantastic movie. Definitely, definitely recommend that one. I think I've got the name right. Uh, the current war. I think it is that um, it might not be, but if you look up uh, Edison Cumberbatch, you will find that movie. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's entertaining and it's mostly historically accurate. Uh, they do kind of like tug and pull at some timelines and when exactly certain things occur but they also go into the history of Tesla and Edison's working relationship because Tesla had worked in Edison's lab for a number of years before he struck out on his own. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that given the way that Elon Musk has kind of, um, you know, utilized the Tesla name over right. the last you know decade plus, uh, yep. we're looking at the reemergence of the Tesla legacy if not in totality of vision, at least symbolically and um, referentially in regards to electricity. So yeah, that's probably like my, you know, that would be the one thing that I would really want to see if I could get in a time machine and go back to the event. If I, the first thing I would say is like, wow, you should have found a better location to hide this time machine. Cause here I am, I'm using it. I shouldn't just leave it out in the open with the keys still right. in sticking in it, the ignition. Yeah. <laughs> um, the thing with the thing with these world fairs is um, they typically leave some lasting physical impact behind, mm. even when that impact's meant to be temporary. I think in in um, San Francisco, uh, the Palace of the Fine Arts there uh, was not meant to be a permanent structure uh, around to this day. I'm, I'm curious. I'm not in Chicago. I, I don't get to wander the, the streets uh as much as I'd like to. Um, and I don't know necessarily what's still there. Is there anything physically still remaining from this hundred and what, what are we now? 128 years, I guess. Or, there we yeah. go. Yep. Uh, yeah. 128 years ago. I mean, what, what's still there? Yeah. So there are a number of things that can still be seen. Uh, what I would say first is in Jackson park, there are still lagoons and those are left over from the canals that were dug into the area. So south of what is currently the museum of science and industry is the lagoon. Um, you can, there's still an area referred to as the Japanese garden, which is where the ho o -den, the Phoenix temple, which was an installation from the nation of Japan on that Island. Yep. Um, unfortunately that was uh, burnt down. 
during World War II, um, you know, whether it was an accident or a... Or an act uh, of racism. Uh, we yeah, don't... well, I mean, like, I, I think that, like, uh, just a general, like, you know, cultural hatred, you know, whether, you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to, like, just be like, oh, they were, they were racist or whatever. They were obviously, there was a lot of really heinous stuff going on between all sorts of people. Uh, that particular incident, what we have now is we don't have it, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't, right. don't want to speculate on what all the things are about. Yeah, exactly. So, like, you know, that still has some some lasting legacy. Uh, and the Museum of Science and Industry, as you mentioned, the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco wasn't intended to be a permanent structure. Now, in 1893, uh, the Palace of Fine Arts had to be constructed to a higher quality because the nations that were contributing art to the event would not send it there without a building that was uh, more permanent and protective and would, you know, allow them to ensure this art because, you know, fire, <laughs> right? Or yeah. water damage and things like that. So Chicago was no stranger to that, right? Right, exactly. So you have the Museum of Science and Industry today, uh, which is a rebuild of the Palace of Fine Arts. Yes, the palace stood for a number of decades after the event. However, it fell into disrepair. Uh, it didn't completely crumble, but it needed a lot of work, and it was completely reconditioned, I believe, in like the 30s. Um, gotcha. I, I might be wrong, but the collection that had been there was moved north um, to what is now the Field Museum. So that brings us up to... Uh, the downtown area. So the Field Museum was not built for the event, but its collection uh, started from the Columbian Exposition. Many of the uh, countries and vendors didn't want to take everything home. So they just <laughs> said, you know what? Here, here it is. Then you can start a museum from this stuff because the cost of dragging it back is not worth it. You right. find that at trade shows to this day. It still happens. Yeah. Um, so let's go a little bit further uh, northwest in Jackson Park, and we hit what is now the Art Institute. And that building was built uh, as the auxiliary building for the event. So that was like a meeting building. There were many conferences and discussion groups and all sorts of collections of people to discuss, um, you know, religion, um, women's issues of the day, um, social issues and political issues that were going on as you know you know we weren't too far away from some significant wars and you know even though europe through the 19th century had hit had kind of like hit a breaking point on war they were just destroying themselves repeatedly over and over and over again they meet uh you know to try and like start to sort this stuff out and you know there's tenuous piece in places and obviously you know that didn't pan out but the art institute uses that building and it is still there and they've expanded on it greatly but the main uh, uh primary structure where you see the lions in front that everybody's familiar with uh those lions were created by edward kemmies uh you know not for the event but he also did do some work inside of the event as well um so yeah, that would be like the the couple major things. There's also a replica of the Statue of the Republic. Um, so that exists south of the lagoon. You can still go see it. It's all, you know, clad in gold. It's one third the size, I think, maybe, or, or half size, something yes. like that. But it's still huge. I mean, it's still right. massive. Um, and that's, it's just, it's beautiful to watch it and, and look at it. I, I find myself... Uh, you know, thinking about that, that imagery and just uh, that object and how huge the, the original one would have been at the time, because I believe it was like 65 feet tall, which just is massive in, in, in context. You know, today, 65 feet might not seem like that much, but uh, I try to put myself into the mind frame of people of that time and to see this mm -hmm. huge grand basin these massive buildings this huge sculpture um you know glittering in gold and it's just wow you know man what yeah. I, I missed out on that i think back to, to what you were saying about the impact of seeing something like that or electric light or or getting up to the top of the ferris wheel in 1893 and putting it in context of a person in 1893 who arrives either by train or 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 um uh, wagon or whatever to the area and gets to experience that for the first time 
it's pretty remarkable. In addition to that, I think about the international scope of the exposition because it wasn't as easy as hopping on uh, a modern jet plane and and uh, zooming across uh, the Atlantic or the Pacific. Talk to me about, okay, I guess the way I'll phrase it is this. In the same way that Taco Bell does not represent uh, Mexican culture and Pizza Hut does not represent uh, Italian culture. Um, I don't think Epcot can do uh, the expo justice, but it's the closest example that most people have to seeing mm. uh, pavilions uh, uh, from different countries and experiencing food and, and culture from different countries, accurate or not. This is this is so much bigger than that. This is at, mm. at such a much larger scale. Can you talk a little bit on the international participation? It was massive. Yeah. So you're looking at essentially... Um... I would say most of the European nations had a presence there. Uh, a good number of Asian nations had a presence there. Um, nations from the Middle East and uh, Northern Africa had a presence there. The Egyptian installation was significant and popular. Uh, so they had a replica street of Cairo that was well-frequented. You know, there are many pictures from that and, uh, you know, it just looks great. It's, it's fun, you know, to, to kind of see these things brought over. And yes, you know, there are some issues in regards to uh, authenticity in that time. Some people even like, then, even, even then, them. even then, yeah, even then they would say like, well, I'm not so certain, certain that these, uh, uh, you know, people are, you know, really displaying their culture properly or whatever. And then there's also just the exploitative nature of some of these installations as well. <laughs> You know, and I don't want to I don't want to shy away from that because it was that was explicitly happening. No doubt about it. Um, not only with the international presence there. And again, there were people from, uh, you know, South America. Brazil had a massive installation. Um, there was it's a paper mache replicas of ruins from the Yucatan that were brought in. Um, and also there were Native American installations there, which were. Oh, right. You know, yeah, and at different times they were again. This is like what we're seeing this this juxtaposition of we want to display, uh, you know, the magnificence of these cultures and the um, the eccentric components of them, and really highlight this. And uh, at the same time, like there's uh, you know this push to get the last tribes into reservations and losing their land. And, um, you know, just like stomping on the neck of these cultures. So like, that's the exact thing that's happening. I think that is, again, very human. We do these things. We have two hands, you know, one, you know, is wielding a sword and another is like handing you a meal. And like, that is like very much what we see across time. I don't think that we're ever going to um, decouple ourselves from this very human nature kind of uh, way about us and like that's not to say that one thing is right one thing is wrong it's just the nature of things and we can do better um, but at the same time I don't want to shy away from knowing that those things occur that these yeah. exploitative things or these destructive things happen because as soon as you start to kind of like whitewash some of this stuff or you know only hear one perspective on it uh, then that's when we lose, right? To not yeah. hear the, and again, like this is the Colombian exposition. It's named after Christopher Columbus. Okay. Right. So his legacy has been, um, you know, uh, being altered in terms of perspective, particularly yeah. over the last like 50 years. So, yeah. you know, and, and here's the thing, like, so I have, uh, you know, I have family from Europe, from Spain. I have native American family. So like, uh, you know, also I am, white like how do i reconcile these things like i'm not i'm not taking sides i'm looking at this stuff and saying this was occurring this yeah. did occur like i'm not i'm not gonna like go to battle over any of this stuff like i'm just purely interested in uh knowing and understanding yeah. and that's just me you know but anybody can like have a chip on their shoulder or like you know uh have an axe to grind that's all cool for them that's not my bag I, I think that's that's really a fair thing to say. The other thing is to take things in the context of the time in which they occurred. Um, Correct. You know, uh, it does not change how horrible some of the acts that um, we believe uh, Christopher Columbus to have uh, committed. Right. Um, doesn't change how horrible they are. Right. At all. 
in the same way that any of the other things that were maybe uh, socially acceptable or, or normative um, in our own country uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. It doesn't it doesn't correct those either. But you nope. have to look at it through the lens of of the time as well. I know that in my own you know family history, when I look back, I, I see things that I'm proud of. I see you know, abolitionists. I have uh, very well documented family members that were a part of the Underground Railroad and helping um, folks ex- escape uh, to the north um, from from being slaves in the south. But I also know that in my family tree, I have a lot of stuff that I'm not proud of to include, you know, um, folks that fought on the side of the Confederacy and, and had some uh, questionable uh, things that they've done. So I, I think that, you know, to your point about how do I reconcile this, I, I know that I can only control my actions and how I live my life and how I treat people. And I cannot control what uh, my ancestors might have done. And, and, and it's unfortunate, but uh, I think, it, like you said, it's important to recognize it and not whitewash it and to be honest about what has occurred. Yeah. You know, a lot of, a lot so of to dive into that change the past uh, uh, in terms of rewriting the history books. And I don't think that's fair. Yeah, I, I, that is kind of like where I like to draw the line. So there's um, also a really interesting thing uh, that I found kind of uncovering this. So we, we definitively know that uh, Norsemen or Vikings or whatever you want to call them made it to North America at this point. It's undisputable fact. Like we know this happened. Yep. They were here. No doubt about it. In Columbus's time, uh that was also known actually they knew that um he he yeah so like it was yes in other parts of europe it was like rumored like oh maybe they made it over there or whatever in in the nordic regions of europe it's like no we made it there we know we made it there and also like they, they talked about going there uh Leif Erikson, Eric the Red and all that, like they all came here and ended up in like Vinland or whatever it was like um, th- that island where those um, structures have been getting uncovered by archaeologists over the last, I don't know, couple decades or whatever. Um, so that's that's definitive, you know, and because yeah. he crossed paths with that legend, he was confident to say, I can go west. Yeah, he sold it as like, let's go get these spices over in, uh, you know, in Asia or whatever. But like, uh, the way that it panned out was like, I think that he had a hunch that there was something else out there and a, a, a very convinced hunch, not even a hunch just was like, Oh, these people speak as if they hit this area that, yeah. and not a legend. This isn't a myth. You know, they're not speaking about it mythologically, which, you know, yeah. Uh, I would say maybe the 19th century is kind of the end of mythos, right? But in 14, in the 1470s, the 1480s, the 1490s, you know, myth is still significant, but... Beware of the Kraken, right? Um, right, beware of the Kraken, but he wasn't beware of the Kraken, uh, you know, worried about that, or, you know, here be dragons or something. He was like, <laughs> no, these guys, they've got maps of that. They are yeah. speaking of this factually and um uh, maybe i can also go see it so and he made multiple voyages too you know you can't he, right. he return um four yeah yeah about the colombian exposition i just want to wrap up that real quick before i i uh ask you about your other works with this particular project and i know that there's still more to come with it um what can people find right now that you've done because i know there's a book i know okay. that there's some some uh content uh that is uh, more digital i guess Mm -hmm. um could you share with me what's available out there for sure yeah so as i spoke uh, about earlier um you know i started this on social media you can connect with the chicago 1893 project on facebook or instagram or twitter uh and you can you can you know see the timelines there if you're interested in that um also there is uh you know the book uh, that is a paperback on Amazon or Lulu. You can get an ebook on Amazon, um, maybe even Apple Books. Uh, then you can get the audiobook on Audible. I have released uh, a line of merchandise that's available on Teespring. So some of the photos and things like that available on mugs or pillows and stuff like that. Uh, you know, great gifts for this time of year. Um, then also I released the documentary, which is on Amazon. I've got... Uh, that's also on Gumroad, and I'll be putting out the shorter version of the documentary on Gumroad at some point as well. 
Uh, I think I'll have one that's like 10 minutes and one that's five minutes. So I can kind of see the and utilize them in different ways. Uh, there is a soundtrack to the documentary available on Bandcamp. And right now I am working the Columbia Exposition back to life reality so whether that forms up into virtual reality or an augmented reality experience right now we're developing the assets i've got a general uh storyline going and trying to uh you know be able to show some of what we've been working on um over the last few months uh next year i would like to be able to to get the first preview of that out so that people can can actually um believe what i'm saying <laughs> very very More or less and then, you know, I, I connected with you uh, after releasing uh, an episode with the social media coordinator for Yellowstone, uh, Jacob Frank. And awesome. um, and, you know, the the national parks uh, are something that that recently were of interest to, to me and, and a lot of my listeners. You've done a lot of incredible work uh, covering the national parks. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, they're beautiful and everybody should go and take your camera and take, you know, family or friends and visit them and spend some time there and get to know these, these uh, natural wonders that we have across the country. So I've been to a few of them, I think maybe about 20 and there are, I don't know, like 60 or something. I'm not, I'm not I, I play fast and loose with the numbers because they change them. They create new spots and, you know, Truthfully, yep. uh, I don't intend to go to all of them. I want to go to the ones that speak to me. There are other people that, you know, they need to check off. They need to 100% the national parks. To me, I really just want to see the things I want to see. So mm -hmm. I had been taking photos and writing about it. Um, again, uh, this was, gosh, I don't know, 2016, 2017 and had been kind of issuing those things out again i got to the point where i was like i kind of have a lot of stuff here i wonder what i could do with it and also i had released the Colombian exposition book um and i was like well what what could i <laughs> you know offer as a follow-up to this just to kind of show like this is not a difficult thing you can write and publish and you know uh get something out there and be able to hold the fruits of your work you know which i think is um you know maybe something that's becoming a foreign concept as we become, uh, become more and more digital or go paperless or whatever, like artifacts mm -hmm. of humanity, you know, create them. It's important too. So there's yeah. a video series there for that. There's a book, um, you know, that's available on Amazon. The video series is available on gum. Um, I do intend to create a volume two because the, the way that it panned out is when I started gathering it all up, I said, uh, well, I've got a lot of stuff. I've got too much stuff for one book right now to be able to like, manufacture this within the time frame that I wanted to. So I kind of like cut half of the stuff and uh, volume two, hopefully next year, <laughs> if I can, if I can uh, muster myself to, to do the layout and all that, it, it, it's, you know, primarily written needs a lot more editing needs all total totality of the layout needs to be done. Um, right. and none of that has been started. It's basically just the rough draft edits of the parks, whether or not they were released as a blog, or, you know, some of them have also been released as videos uh, already and stuff like that, too. So it does exist. Um, you know, that that's kind of, uh, you know, on the back burner, but it's going to soon become a focal point. Um, and then I've been working on uh, a project that is called How to Create a Personal Brand in mm -hmm. 10 Steps, which is basically a content development workbook and video course. So the book is now out and that kind of draws inspiration from, and here's, here's an aside. I actually started this book before the other two. Okay. So, yeah. So I started writing that cause I've worked in media and advertising and content development and stuff like that for a long time as a musician. Um, and also as, um, you know, as a, as a contractor and vendor for other people. Right. So I wanted to, illustrate how to do this stuff but as i was beginning to work through it i had my first draft of it you know like i said a few years ago i was like well you know what there's some stuff inside of this that i want to be able to point at other stuff not client work um you know for a variety of reasons um and i then said well what if i go and do these things have them available to point at and also you know it becomes this little ecosystem of projects um, that exist 
you know, outside of me. So like this stuff kind of does its own thing additionally. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm at the keyboard, you know, I'm helming this, but like, you know, we're connected because those channels exist independently of me and they're, they're doing things or they're releasing stuff that like at times, like I'm not retweeting or like, you know, I'm not like sharing it on Facebook or whatever. And like, they're interacting with people and stuff like that. Um, and like that sometimes has some overlap with me as an individual and sometimes doesn't like here we are, you know? Right. Um, but I think that anybody can do this. You know, that is something that I really want to get across that anyone can spend the time and etch away at an idea and create something. Uh, and that's really what the Columbian exposition project is about too. So like the bookend to that is that like the space race of the 1960s is this really, um, it's this like gunshot moment where all of a sudden it's like, wow, this is super incredible and influential. And it gathered so many people together, you know, not, not even in just the U S but around the world. And obviously Russia, we, we were competing with, you know, was trying to, to, to get into space and, and do all this stuff that, you know, we wanted to do. And we kept going back and forth with those accomplishments. And I think that's fantastic. I think that's great. Yes. The cold war terrible. Like that's not cool. The, a lot of really, uh, terrible things occurred through that, whether it's just nation to nation or proxy. Uh, but the space race is kind of like that gem out of that period of time. Yeah. And perhaps we need something like that, you know, um, you know, space race, or we need, you know, a world's fair, you know, right now in this year, there is a world's fair going on in Dubai, the exposition that's going on. Yeah. It was supposed to be last year. Obviously, it had to be postponed, and it is going on. But, like, you don't really hear too much about that um, in general, and that's unfortunate, you know, because these are events that bring many people together to create things and illustrate the, uh, you know, the fine uh, examples of humanity. So I think that anyone can create fine examples of humanity and, um, you know, just start to, to draft your ideas, get them out of your head, start to connect some dots and create things, you know, whatever speaks to you, wherever you, uh, are discovering traction and momentum. That is usually a a pretty good indicator that you're on the right path. I would say. I I think I fully agree. And and honestly, uh, speaking of fine examples of humanity, um, you know, you, you, sir, have done us a wealth of good by bringing all this together. And uh, thanks for, for coming on and, and sharing this with me today and with our listeners. I would like to ask you where they can find you or your projects, rather, in the social media world. Absolutely. So if you go to my website, uh, michael-finney.com, uh, it will connect you with all the major social channels that I utilize on a fairly regular basis. Uh, as well as the ones for the Columbian Exposition Project, Chicago 1893 Project, uh, and the National Parks Project. I will be loading up links um, for the uh, personal branding project uh, before this episode goes live. So all of those things will be there, and you can connect with all or some or none (laughs) of those things if you like. That's great. And I'll, I'll make sure to include it in the show notes, folks, so you can find it as easy as possible. So you're not writing out the word hyphen and, and typing in Michael hyphen. Uh, <laughs> um, but Good yeah, I, I really think uh, honestly and truly that uh, it's worth checking out, especially the 1893 project. That's my my favorite of, of what you've done so far, although I know the best is yet to come with you. And you're welcome back on the show anytime, Michael. Hey, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. And, um, you know, I think that as, as you keep going along with this, as you said, you know, it started out as a, 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 a pandemic pastime, you know, mm-hmm. who knows where it will evolve to in the yeah. future. And then that's the, that's the, that's the great part of being a creative. Yep. We're, we're just uh, getting started here. Uh... And that'll do it for another episode of the Know It Some podcast. My thanks again to Michael Finney for your time and the wealth of knowledge that you brought to this episode. Thanks so much. You are welcome back anytime, my friend. Folks, if you have not done so already, please head on over to Apple, iTunes, or Podchaser. Leave us a five-star ranking and review. It is the very best way to support the show and ensure that we continue to bring you great guests week in and week out. Another great way to support the show would be to follow us on your favorite social media platform, and like and share our posts with your friends. 
We are all over social media at Know It Some Pod. That's Know It Some Pod on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, you name it. We are there at Know It Some Pod. Please like and share our posts. Tell your friends as we grow this community. It's been an amazing journey. We have brought you some of the most interesting guests I can think of, and we are just getting started. I just want to say to all the listeners, thank you for listening, and I'll see you next week.